Well, tensions are escalating in West Asia. The leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, has issued a renewed chilling warning to Israel. The leader of Lebanon's Iran-backed group says that Tehran's retaliation is inevitable and that the suspected Israeli attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria was a turning point. The warnings has put Israel and its long-term ally, the U.S., on high alert. According to reports, the U.S. preparing or the U.S. is preparing for a possible attack by Iran targeting Israeli or American assets in the region. At the same time, Israel has also increased its security alert to the highest level. According to reports again, Israel has initiated an urgent evacuation of its consulates. The precautionary measure includes relocating some Israeli diplomatic representatives to safer locations and advising against the organization of public events. The decision taken by U.S. and Israel comes on the backdrop of a written message where Iran has asked the U.S. to step aside if it doesn't want any war to get dragged or into Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's trap as the country prepares a response to a suspected Israeli attack on its consulate in Syria. While Hezbollah, its main proxy in West Asia, has warned that Israel or has warned Israel that it is prepared for war. In an address to supporters to mark Al Quds Day, the militant group's leader said the matter of violating Iranian sovereignty is above all political differences. He says they support Iran's right to punish Israel, while also stating that a response was coming. The issue of the Iranian consulate is a turning point in the events that occurred from October 7th till today. Be certain, be sure that the Iranian response to the targeting of consulate in Damascus is definitely coming against Israel. The Hezbollah chief is not alone in issuing a warning to Israel. Iran too had vowed to take a revenge. Tehran says their response to the attack will be decisive. This failure of the Israeli regime in Gaza will definitely continue as well as these desperate efforts like what they did in Syria, of course. They will be slapped for this action. All right, let's talk about what is happening in West Asia and joining us now is retired Colonel David B. Desroches who is an associate professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Security Studies is now joining us live from Washington, D.C. Colonel David, good to see you. We've seen what uh, Iran has said, and we've seen what Hezbollah has said. What does this mean for Israel going forward? Because uh, the war now seems to be deviating course. Well, it's, I think it's actually a distraction. Um, you know, Israel has uh, carried out actions against IRGC personnel uh, and Iranian leaders for a long time. They assassinated the head of Iran's nuclear program in Tehran. They stole Iran's uh, nuclear archives out of Tehran. Um, you know, so this, you know, given the fact, you know, the embassy is sovereign Iranian territory. But Israel has been acting in sovereign Iranian territory for decades. So I think this is more uh, Iranian chest beating trying to capitalize on the Gaza war, but also distract from the fact that, you know, you've had a blast by um, uh, Islamic State that killed over 100 people in Kerman in the last few months. Uh, just the last few days, 16 Revolutionary Guards were killed by uh, Baluch separatists in eastern Iran. And, you know, can't forget in the last month, uh, Iran launched a missile strike against Pakistan. Pakistan responded with an airstrike. So there's a lot of conflict in Iran. But the one thing that unites the Iranian people is a dislike for Israel. So I think there's an element of deception or misdirection here. Colonel David, we've seen the U.S. has issued a red alert. Also, Israel has mm -hmm. issued the same red alert. Um, Hezbollah says and Iran say that uh, the response or their responses will be inevitable and decisive. What should we expect? I, I think we'll expect something inevitable but not decisive. So I think uh, what um, Iran's MO in the past has been to strike uh, isolated facilities overseas uh, you know, outside of the Middle East that are either Israeli diplomatic facilities or uh, Jewish uh, centers. 
So, um, you know, the Iranian regime doesn't make a distinction between the Jewish religion and uh, the Israeli state. So their greatest uh, success overseas was against the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. So I think they're going to try and replicate something like that. Hezbollah, on the other hand, their role uh, assigned to them by Iran uh, is to serve as a break on Israeli action uh, to remind the Israelis of their large missile inventory and potentially restrain uh, Israeli responses directly against Iran. Colonel David, finally, what does this conflict mean for West Asia? What effect will it have on the region? Well, it, it has the potential of widening the conflict, and we've seen that, you know, the Biden administration has been very, very measured in its response to the attacks on uh, U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria um, and and in Yemen, um, that the, the response has been very, very limited and narrow, uh, and only rarely have um, senior leaders of various Iranian uh, uh, aligned militias been attacked. I think that there's a possibility here that because Iranian pride is damaged. They might uh, attack something that's more significant that then re requires an American response that then will require an Iranian response. So the fear is that this might be the start of a um, inevitable cycle uh, upward of response that expands and response that expands. But it's important to note that, you know, the, the the proximate cause of this was an attack against Revolutionary Guard officers and the attack in Damascus while it was on Iranian soil. Uh, it didn't kill the Iranian ambassador, and as far as I know, it didn't kill any diplomats. It only killed Revolutionary Guard officers. So this is not that different from other Israeli attacks. The difference is Iranian pride. All right. I've been talking to an associate professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Security Studies, retired Colonel David B. Desroches. As always, thank you very much for your insights and for talking to us today. It's an honor. U.S. President Joe Biden asked the leaders of Egypt and Qatar to pressure Hamas militants to agree to a Gaza ceasefire and a hostage deal. This comes ahead of a fresh round of talks this weekend in Cairo. According to an official in the U.S., CIA Director Bill Burns will be leading the U.S. delegation to the Cairo talks. David Banya, the head of Mossad, Israel's spy agency, and negotiators from Egypt and Qatar are expected to attend as well. The Hamas side of the talks is indirect, with proposals relayed through third parties to Hamas leaders sheltering in tunnels beneath Gaza. A senior Biden administration official says that Biden wrote letters to Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh al-Thani, on the state of the hostage deal and talks. He asked them to secure commitments from Hamas to agree and abide by a deal. This comes one day after Biden called on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to redouble efforts to reach a ceasefire in the next six months. That is, to reach a ceasefire in the, ne in the six month old war in Gaza. Excuse me for that. Biden warned Netanyahu that Israel must take steps to address harm to civilians and humanitarian suffering saying Washington will take unspecified steps in their response. The U.S. and its allies view a ceasefire as essential to allowing more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza amid fears of famine among the Palestinians. Under the most recent proposal, Israel and Hamas would agree to a six-week ceasefire in exchange for the release of sick, the elderly and wounded hostages held by Hamas. Israel's deadly attack, which killed seven aid workers in Gaza, has triggered public condemnation and given rise to several questions. There is desperate need for a safety passage for aid to be delivered into the war-torn enclave. In the latest backlash, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for an independent investigation into the death of 196 aid workers. Following this week's appalling killing of seven humanitarian workers from World Central Kitchen, the Israeli government has acknowledged mistakes and announced some disciplinary measures. 
But the essential problem is not who made the mistakes. It is the military strategy and procedures in place that allow for those mistakes to multiply time and time again. Fixing those failures requires independent investigations and meaningful and measurable changes on the ground. It is obviously for the government of Israel to accept the possibility of that independent investigation because the investigation can only work with the cooperation of the Israeli authorities. But as I said, the question is not this only specific incident. 196 humanitarian workers have been killed, and we want to know why each one of them was killed. Following the attack, Open Arms, a humanitarian organization that was working with Wild Food Kitchen, has suspended Maritime Aid Corridor after its colleagues were killed. The 15-member United Nations Security Council also held a meeting on Friday. Members discussed the attacks on aid workers in the Gaza Strip, as well as the fear of an imminent famine which looms large over 2.3 million Palestinians in the Strip. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that the U.S. is carefully reviewing Israel's inquiry into the strike that killed aid workers. We uh, received Israel's report on the terrible killing of the World Central Kitchen uh, team in Gaza uh, a few days ago. We're reviewing it very carefully. Uh, we'll be discussing its conclusions with Israeli officials and with humanitarian organizations uh, in the days to come. Uh, it's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. Following global outrage over the actions of Israeli forces in Gaza, Israel says it has dismissed two officers and formally reprimanded senior commanders of the IDF. This is after an inquiry into the deadly strike this week found serious errors and breaches of procedure. Thousands of Muslims gathered at Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque to hold prayers overnight to mark Laylat al Qadir. For many Muslims, Laylat al Qadir, which translates to Night of Power, is an opportunity to enhance willpower and begin a journey of spiritual growth through prayer. Worshippers crowded the narrow lanes leading to the Al Aqsa Mosque compound in the heart of the old city of Jerusalem, home to the third holiest shrine to Muslims known to Jews as Temple Mount. Meanwhile, protests continue across the world against Israel's offensive in Gaza, which has killed over 33,000 Palestinians. According to the enclave's health authorities, hundreds of Jordanians and Palestinians continue to rally near the Israeli embassy in Amman for the second week in support of Palestinians in Gaza. The Israeli embassy, where protesters gathered daily, has long been a flashpoint of anti-Israel protests at times of turmoil in Gaza. In Poland, there was a small protest outside the foreign ministry in Warsaw, just as Israel's ambassador was apologizing for an Israeli airstrike that killed a Polish aid worker in Gaza this week. Demonstrators marched through central London as pro-Palestinian groups around the world marked Al-Quds Day. Al-Quds Day is an annual pro-Palestinian event held on the last Friday of the Muslim fasting month of Ramadan. The demonstrators were met by pro-Israeli counter-protesters when passing near Parliament, while a large number of police held both groups in line. In Pakistan, around 3,000 men, women and children marched through the city of Karachi, farther north. Over 2,000 people demonstrated in Pakistan's capital Islamabad and smaller rallies were held in other cities like Quetta in Balochistan province. Hundreds of people in Istanbul held a symbolic funeral prayer for Palestinians killed in Israel's six-month war on Hamas in Gaza outside Faith Mosque. 
on Al Quds Day. The demonstrators then marched to Sarachane Park. The protesters asked the Turkish government to stop trading with Israel and Azerbaijan to stop selling it its oil. Crowds marched in Iraq's capital Baghdad, marking the annual Al Quds Day. Demonstrators held flags and signs in support of Palestinians and in opposition to Israel and the U.S. Thousands of Yemenis, including Houthi supporters, marched to mark Al Quds Day in Sana as well. Indian Muslims held protests in solidarity with Palestinians in eastern Kolkata city. Members of student Islamic organization took to the streets and raised slogans against Israel for committing atrocities on Palestinians. The protesters called on Indians to boycott Israeli goods and unite to pray for peace in the world. For all the latest news, download the Wion app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.